It's turn uh, as God enables us for a short time tonight to John's Gospel, chapter 3, the passage we read together and the very familiar words of verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Uh, two years ago at the barn of Ferentosh, when we were uh, rained off, I began preaching, um, which was a very short sermon, as you recall. Um, it was John 3.16. You probably don't remember the text, but you remember the rain. Um, and it was uh, cut short. And uh, reflecting on it last week, I thought perhaps it would be fitting to revisit this uh, text that uh, is, uh, as I say, uh, so um, familiar to, to all of us. Do you remember the World Cups of yesteryear when the camera would occasionally catch someone in a very large stadium with a placard and written on it, John 3.16? Have you seen one in the Euros? I haven't. I haven't seen one for some time. But some years back, it was a very common occurrence that would be someone with a banner with John 3.16. Very, very powerful uh, when the camera caught that. So why John 3.16? Well, probably because it's been described as the gospel in a nutshell. So I hope that we can open that nutshell tonight. We'll crack it open um, by looking at three things. The focus of God's love, the scope of God's love, and the purpose of God's love. All three are encapsulated in John 3.16. And we're calling it definitive love because this is it. What is love? John tells us God is love. And John 3.16 gives us the focus of his love, its scope and purpose. So when we begin to focus on the, 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 the focus of God's love, it's remarkable that we begin with the world. Yes, this contaminated, ruined, corrupted world is the focus, the object of God's love. After all, John 3.16 begins with the words, for God so loved the world. Why is that? How is that? Because it's your world, it's my world. But it's a world of gospel resistance, isn't it? It always was, and yet it becomes the focus of God's love. The description that Paul gives of this world of ours makes grim reading. He says, none, none is righteous. No, not one. All have turned aside. No one does good in this world of ours. There is no fear of God before their eyes. <clears throat> but when we read John 3.16, this world that Paul speaks of, it's the focus, the object of God's love. So John 3.16 John 3, is remarkable because we're you and I may, might have expected judgment from God. There is instead mercy. Where you and I might have expected condemnation from heaven. There is instead grace. The gospel in a nutshell. The heavenly gardener of John 3.16 has not abandoned oh. his weed-infested oh. garden that we are introduced to back in Genesis chapter 3. God does not abandon the wayward sons and daughters of Adam. God will do for man what man cannot do for himself. He sends his one and only 
Son. John 3.16 tells us emphatically that tragedy is turned to triumph in Jesus Christ. John 3.16 tells us, too, that rebellion is turned to restoration through Jesus Christ. And John 3.16 underlines that greed is overcome by grace. It's good news. The good news that the angel spoke of in, in Luke's gospel. News that will, that will cause great joy for all the people. A saviour has been born to you. So how do we sum up John 3.16? The focus of God's love. Well, we can say this much, can't we? It is all of grace. Paul says elsewhere, all things are of God, the God of all grace who reconciles sinners to himself through Jesus Christ, a God rich in mercy. And as we said earlier, a God whom John later defines and describes with just one word, God is love. And Paul says that through God's love, objects of wrath are transformed into trophies of grace. That is your testimony tonight if you are a believer. And this love, the Greek word, again, it's a word that we're familiar with. It's the, it's familiar with. It's the word agape, sacrificial love that gives without holding back. Have you experienced the love of God in Christ? Do you remember the day it touched your life? Can you recall its transforming power when God so loved you? Perhaps some of us see ourselves as beyond the redemption that again is the great focal point of John 3.16. Some see themselves as sinful beyond salvage, but John 3.16 says otherwise. It's bulging with the gospel. So that's the focus of God's love in a word. Secondly, we have the scope of God's love. Now, John 3.16 is is oozing with theology. Now, sometimes whenever ministers mention theology, then folk are often put off. We associate theology with ETS, with HTC, but no, we can grasp this theology, the theology of John 3.16, the scope, the extent to which God so loved the world is in the giving of his one and only son. John says in 1 John 4.10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. To what extent, John? Give us the scope of God's love, if you will. To this extent, John says, that he sent his son, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, God's holiness demands punishment for man's sin. God, therefore, in his steadfast love, sent his son to, uh, to make a substitutionary atonement for your sin and my sin through Jesus Christ. In this way, God's wrath is satisfied or appeased. But notice that John also allows us to see and understand the extent to which God the Father gave his son as an atoning sacrifice. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, he says in 1 John 2.2. But he doesn't stop there. There is no period 
He goes on to say, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. After all, that's what it says, isn't it, in John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Now, this implies something profound from a theological perspective. It implies that the scope, the extent of God's love in sending the Son as an atoning sacrifice is no less than global. In other words, John 3.16 has a rich international flavor to it. Does that mean it's pointing us towards universal salvation? That Jesus died for everyone? And that everyone will ultimately be saved regardless and go to heaven anyway? No, of course not. However, it does mean this, that God's love reaches a diversity of people the world over. Again, listen to the words of the angel that we referred to earlier. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people, for a diversity of people across the world. So forgiveness through Christ's atoning sacrifice has this worldwide application, gospel application. Now, this is a significant point which would have, which would have alerted Nicodemus. Always bear in mind that John 3.16 is a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the making. Jesus is addressing one individual. And he's a strict Jew at that. And how astonishing it would have been to Nicodemus that the extent of God's love applies to both Jew and Gentile. The Christ, the Jews eagerly awaited, the, Jew, the, the, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one that they have been waiting for is their Messiah exclusively theirs. And this Jewish pride and prejudice left many Jews and Gentiles at opposite ends of a hostile divide of intense discrimination. So for Nicodemus, the theology factor is earth shattering. But I hope it's music to our ears tonight. That God so loved you and I that he gave his one and only son in our place. Condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon and your pardon with his blood. Thirdly, the purpose of God's love. The purpose of God's love is quite simple. Whoever believes in him, will not under any circumstances perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. And the key word here is whoever. Let's be clear that there are no dividing walls, Berlin or Mexican, with Jesus. He's a savior with whom there is no discrimination, bias, inequality, or favoritism. Go through the Gospels, and you will find that the Gospel writers verify this great truth. The Samaritans in the following chapter, in John chapter 4, they, they come to believe in Jesus. And of course, it's no coincidence that chapter four revolves around Samaria, a place despised by so many Jews. And if, if, it, if it meant walking through the turf of Samaria, you would opt for the bypass. You would give it a wide berth. You would take an alternative route rather than walk on this contaminated soil 
or Samaria. And look at how verse 4 in chapter 4 begins. Jesus had to go through Samaria. And there he met the Samaritan woman at the well, of course. And ultimately, when we get to verse 42, the Samaritans are shouting from the rooftops that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world, a region so discriminated against by the religious leaders of the day. But who cares if you're a Samaritan? You have discovered the extent, the focus, the scope, and the purpose of God's love in Christ. And remember the words of Paul in Romans 10, 13, for there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich to all, who call upon him. For whoever, as he borrows this word from John 3, 16, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's be clear that the gospel is for everyone. For every man, for every woman, for every boy and girl, regardless of status, social class, upbringing, personal history, education or lack of it. No matter what a person's bio is, the gospel is for everyone. No one is excluded, John 3.16 emphasizes. Nobody is barred from coming to Jesus Christ. The gospel isn't race sensitive, it's not class sensitive, it's all encompassing. John 3.16 highlights this much to us. Jesus is the true light who came into the world to save sinners. And he's freely offered in the gospel. That's why John 3.16 is the key verse chosen for a placard in a stadium where there are tens of thousands of people because it is the gospel in just a few words. And in that sense, even if we consider ourselves to be a nobody, we have a commission when we grasp John 3.16 over the summer. Whatever we are, let's mull over these words. And we, when we have a window of opportunity, we can do what another nobody did when he said, I'm a nobody, telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. And he's Jesus. And John 3, 16 highlights who he is and why he came. The UK has offered 5.4 million Hong Kong residents the right to live here and eventually become perhaps citizens. It's estimated that some 300,000 will take up uh, this visa offer over the next five years. They could come here. It's possible. We as a congregation would welcome them. I hope, I trust, I know we would. As they settle perhaps in the Highlands, in Rothschild, in the Black Isle, wherever, we don't know yet. So how do we reach out to them with the gospel? Well, our mission director, David Meredith, was asked in recent days to respond uh, to this. And he spoke of the Hong Kong Ready Gospel Initiative that the Free Church of Scotland uh, is subscribed to. This is what he said. The Free Church of Scotland is excited at the growing ethnic 
diversity in Scotland and revels at the opportunity to show love, kindness and grace to our new Hong Kong friends. The church, said David, has a long history of offering unconditional support to people of no faith, other faiths and the Christian faith as they feel the need to leave their own countries because of curtailment of freedom and even persecution. You know, when I read that in an article in the Times just a few days ago, I thought, John 3.16, this is the spirit of this text. And may each and every one of us revel at the opportunity to show love, kindness, and grace to everyone, regardless of who they are and where they are from, what their circumstances might be. Let's do that without pride, without prejudice, without discrimination, without bias. We will not perish. Jesus will say this again in John 10, 28. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. John 3, 16 speaks of security for time and for eternity. It's a robust promise. And it's yours tonight. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, you will not perish. So let's mull over the focus of God's love over coming weeks. Let's raise the placard as God enables us, wherever we are, wherever we are at work tomorrow, wherever our travels take us on our summer break. Let's be encouraged to share the focus of God's love, the agape of John 3.16, the scope, the purpose of God's love. Let's raise the banner. Let's nail our colors to the mast of John 3.16. And let's be given every encouragement to tell everybody about this somebody who can save anybody. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, our God, our gracious Father in heaven, we praise you for your sacrificial, steadfast, and unfailing love. We marvel at the agape of our God. We ask, Lord, that you would equip us, enable us, energize us by your spirit to reach out with your love over these days. Grant us to be channels of your grace and mercy and peace. We pray that you would be with us so that wherever we are, we might be salt and light, reaching out to everyone and telling everyone that whoever calls upon the name of our God shall be saved. We praise you for the assurance of John 3.16. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep us focused on Jesus. Forgive all our sins in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's sing in conclusion the words of Psalm 9a, verses 7 to 11. Our closing uh, praise this evening as uh, Neil leads us uh, in these words. So Psalm 98, 7 to 11, to the praise of